Hi, welcome to session one of the fifth topic of the semester titled Colonial Society in Transition 1640 to 1763. Once again, this is the first session of the fifth topic that is going to deal with uh, colonial society, American colonial society in transition, meaning we're going to look at colonial society uh, in terms of change, uh, the 13 British colonies are uh, founded and some of them are, will, of course, will be found, will be established in the late 1600s. Uh, but uh, the ones that were already well established uh, in the 1600s, we're going to look how those colonies are going to change uh, the society of the colonies are going to change and we're going to be looking also into the 1700s we're going to look at a great deal of the 1700s we're going to stop in 1763 which is the end of the french and indian war and so we're going to be looking at uh, roughly about at a 130 year period or thereabouts again uh, roughly between 1640 and 1763 uh, looking at again change uh, looking at changes that are taking place in colonial society and um, in order to do that uh, let's go to our slide we're all we're going to pay attention particularly at three areas of colonial society that will be undergoing significant change uh, and those are very important areas again of colonial society one will be religion uh, if you recall, I mean, we devoted uh, an entire topic, the third topic of the semester, looking at uh, the Protestant Reformation, the establishment of uh, religious societies, religious communities in North America by Great Britain. We, were, we, we examined that quite fully, you know, the establishment of New England by the Puritans, the Pilgrims, uh, pa uh, the Quakers in Pennsylvania, etc. So... Uh, religion was a very important force, a very important factor for the colonization uh, of, North of North America by England. And the central purpose of many of the communities that came over during this time was to really create an ideal society, again, you know, a religious community that would be ideal in the eyes of God, according to how they they interpreted the Bible, they interpreted the teachings of Christ, etc. So religion was a very important uh, historical force for the beginning of the United States because at least five colonies were founded by religious groups that came over precisely with the idea that they were coming over to reset humanity and you know begin a whole new experiment, if you will, uh, Christian communities. So... We're going to examine, of course, uh, what happened to those communities uh, as time progressed, you know, as the first founders arrived. We're going to look at religion in the colonies and how uh, the colonists living in those places, you know, the members of those communities of those colonies, uh, continued with the mission, continue with, again, the mission to... Uh, create the ideal society or did they change we're going to look at that of course you know were those religious communities undergoing change etc and what kind of changes they were experiencing we're also going to look at land in this topic uh, in terms of the colonies are going to grow territorially and one of the 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 reasons why the colonies are growing territorially uh, is because we're going to witness uh, starting around the 1650s uh, and beyond we're going to see uh, immigration groups of course the phenomenon of immigration uh, there will be a significant numbers of people arriving uh, from europe to north america to colonize uh, north america on behalf of england and we're going to see that a great many of them were not really uh, coming from england they were coming from other places of europe uh, and they're going to change the social landscape, the cultural landscape, because we're going to see non-English groups, uh, non-English European groups 
that are going to settle in the British colonies and it, this is going to lead to the expansion, the territorial expansion, the territorial growth across the western lands uh, that are going to intensify the interactions between the settlers, the European settlers and the Native American groups. The, and those relationships are going to increase and intensify the contact between the Europeans and the Native Americans are going to intensify and we're going to look at those relationships, the Native American European relations that are going to take place as a result of this uh, flux of immigrants that are coming in from Europe in a whole century again from the 1650s to 1750. We're going to see that the vast majority of the people uh, that are going to be occupying the western lands, you know, growing westward, moving westward, will be European immigrants again. So, and of course, they're going to see a series of interactions again with the Native American groups. All of those interactions are going to be assessed in terms of what kind of interactions existed uh, in how Native American societies, how Native American cultures changed as a result of those interactions. Okay, because Native Americans had a specific way of life, a specific culture, specific social practices that are going to change as a result of uh, coming into contact with new ideas, new religions, new ways of thinking that the Europeans were bringing to the frontier. So we're going to look at that as well. So this is the title, again, of this topic. This is the fifth uh, topic of the semester. It's titled Colonial Society in Transition, 1640 to 1763. And once again, we're going to look at religion, land, and Native European relations. Again, and how those areas of colonial society uh, uh, were changing. Okay, that's what transition actually means. Transition, again, something that is in transition is that it's in flux, it's in change, in other words. All right, so that was uh, a general uh, introduction to this topic. Now let's look at uh, the very first part that uh, this topic is going to look at, and that is religion. Okay, we're going to see first and foremost how those societies, those colonies are going to change as a result of, again, new experiences, uh, economic activities that, of course, people carried out that are going to change people's way of interpreting religion and valuing, at the same time, religion. Of course, it was very valuable. Uh, in the beginning, particularly to the religious communities that arrived to North America, like the Puritans, the Quakers, and others, uh, religion was central to their existence. This was not a secondary activity. Uh, religion was the basis of human existence, and the purpose of human existence um, was to attain salvation. So religion was instrumental in helping human beings in perfecting themselves, achieving perfection, if you will, uh, in their character, in their thinking, in their behavior, uh, and also uh, perfection in terms of raising their, uh, their, their quality of soul, if you will, to the one of a saint, okay, achieving sainthood, that is to say, uh, a great many, you know, believe that that was the purpose of human existence. So religion, of course, uh, was central to their way of life and it was central to their societies. I mean, the, why they came to North America is exactly to create a community that religion was, so, was going to be so central to the society of the colonists that uh, the colonists were going to help each other perfect themselves. They were going to carry out certain religious disciplines, practices, uh, and help each other, of course, stay on track uh, for the purpose of uh, attaining salvation, attaining spiritual perfection. So that was the central purpose. This is the original intent of the founders of New England, Pennsylvania, particularly those two colonies, 
that the Puritans and the Quakers believed that they were coming precisely to establish the kind of society that will facilitate people's uh, progression, spiritual progression, if you will, so they can earn salvation after death. Um, so, uh, as we'll see, uh, beginning around 1660, when we look for 16, 1660 or thereabouts, and we're going to be, of course, looking at the subsequent decades all the way to 1730, what we're going to be looking at is that the second, third, fourth generation uh, of the Puritans and Quakers alike uh, are not going to maintain the same type of purpose as their forefathers who came from England fleeing the persecution of the Catholic kings of England. They were coming to practice their religion in, free, in total freedom. Uh, and the uh, second, third, fourth generation, in other words, the future generations of those original settlers are not going to feel that devoted to religion. Uh, they were religious, but they're not as, as devoted, again, to practice the disciplines, the fasting, reading the Bible every day, attending church activities every day. They're not going to be that devoted anymore as their forefathers. Okay, and so this is extremely important. Uh, not that they abandoned religion, it's just that the values were changing, okay, during this time. And uh, another thing is uh, the original settlers, the founders of those colonies, New England and Pennsylvania, they were fleeing, they were fleeing from persecution. And for them, uh, going to a place to practice their religion was, you know, was central as to why they came to North America. In other words, this is the, you know, why we're here in North America. You know, we just want to be left alone. We just want to practice our faith, uh, our religion. Uh, we're so devoted to it. We, we're so convinced that this is the way, this is the path, and so on and so forth. So they clinged, you know, very steadfast to their religious practices, their religious disciplines, and they were very strict. They were very devoted, okay? Uh, because they had, an, a, you know, an external force pressuring them, you know, persecuting them, uh, if you will. But now... Once they arrived in North America and they established their colonies uh, and they had offspring, of course, uh, this, this, again, first, second, third generation again of Puritans or Quakers, well, there's no more persecution per se, okay? And so you're, you're not going to have a Catholic king persecuting you, telling you to abandon your Protestant ways, in other words. So uh, the people that are already here in North America... That are born here already they're already free you know they're already living in a society that practice the religion of their fathers without any obstructions uh, we're, we're very few obstructions okay so because they don't have an external force pressuring them they're not going to feel that committed to the religion of course the, the parents are always telling you that this is what you should do yeah, you're grown, if you are born into a family of Puritans, for example, well, your parents are going to instill the religion on you. They're going to raise you according to their own Puritan uh, beliefs, their own Puritan religion. Uh, they're going to convince you that, you know, you have to, you know, go to church. You have to be committed to your disciplines and you have to abide by the Puritan rules and so on. Yes, they are going to pressure you, but... Uh, what we're going to see then is that uh, the subsequent generations that are already born in this part of the world are not going to uh, devote most of their time, most of their lives to pursue salvation. Okay, not that salvation was not important to them. I mean, there was. But that's something that could wait. Uh, that could be postponed, you know, you know, the disciplines, the rigorous disciplines, the fasting, all of that can be done on a much later date. In the meantime, what people are concerned is trying to create an affluent society. In other words, 
Uh, what people are concerned in Massachusetts or in Plymouth or in New Hampshire, for example, or in Pennsylvania is really, uh, is there going to be land for me? Okay. Is there going to be a prosperity for me here? Uh, because my aspiration is to own my own piece of land, uh, to be a farmer, for example, to get married, to have children, a family of my own, and pass on the property to my children. Uh, and again, this is what I'm concerned about. Am I going to enjoy this earth, have economic success? In other words, is, you know, they have material uh, desires, they have material aspirations. So this is what people are concerned about, you know, creating some form of enterprise and economic activity that is going to produce wealth for them. Some form of economic security and economic well-being. That's what I'm trying to say. And of course, the Puritans believe that this is pretty much the way we, we save our souls, that the Puritans believe that those that attain economic success uh, are those that God has chosen to go to heaven. So, um, so Puritans, more than anybody else, more than any, uh, any other religious group, are very concerned that they have to demonstrate salvation to their peers, to their family members, to members of their community, by being as successful as possible in this world, in the here and the now, in this material existence, that is to say. So they want land, they want to create an enterprise of some sort, they want, they want to engage in trade, uh, if they can own land for farming or cattle ranching, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, they want to be engaged in succeeding economically. Okay, creating creating uh, some form of uh, enterprise to you know uh, to create some form of success for themselves. So what we're gonna see is precisely because those societies uh, began to build very successful communities, uh, they did so to a point that by the second third generation of Puritans and Quakers alike, we're going to see that those those colonies, whether are the New England colonies or Pennsylvania, uh, as we'll see, of, of course, is that uh, uh, over time, again, as people are coming over to establish those colonies in different time periods, by the way, you know, the Puritans are coming very early in the 1620s, 1630s to New England, and of course, the Quakers will come much, much later, of course. But what I'm trying to say here is that uh, as we see that those colonies are established and people are now creating enterprises that religion will become a secondary issue uh, to the lives of the descendants of the original founders the original settlers of those religious colonies okay uh, religion will still be there it's important to them they identify themselves uh, as members of the religion they identify themselves as Puritans or the Quakers, etc. Yes, it's true. Yeah, but they're not that devoted. They're not that disciplined to the faith, to the religion. Okay. Uh, it, it, again, it's precisely because uh, the colonies are uh, growing economically because of the trade that is taking place, particularly the fur trade. There's fishing industries. There's shipping industries as well. People are, you know building of course ships for transportation purposes and so on there are small manufacturers there's artisans uh, there's farmers etc and it seems that again the colonies were doing very well economically uh, again for 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 having just gotten started in the 1600s they were rapidly you know advancing economically you know rapidly in the 1600s particularly. Uh, so we see the rise of affluent societies that are be becoming more and more secular, okay? Secular society. So what is secular? So a secular society is a society that is oriented towards materialism, okay? So th there's a th very simplistic way of expla explaining or defining secular, but it serves a purpose because it's very, very, uh, it's, 
it's very useful to see it that way. Again, secular societies are societies that are geared towards uh, the material production of goods that people need, like food, clothing, shelter, but furthermore, our society that are geared also to the production of products that people desire, okay? There's also material desires. People desire to have certain material experiences, enjoy this world in secular societies, are societies that are also geared towards material enjoyment, in other words, you know. So it, what we see is that those colonies, yes, originally they were founded by religious groups that their whole purpose was to create a community geared towards, uh, you know, uh, organizing people uh, in, a, in, in a spiritual or religious way to help people attain salvation uh, and religion was central again to those societies but as the generations progressed what we see is that people were becoming more and more concerned more preoccupied with material things with material needs material desires like land uh, economic security enterprise or uh, trade and the like and they wanted to of course have some form of affluence they have they want to be well off they wanted to build some form of wealth uh, for themselves for their families and so on and so forth uh, they want to enjoy this world this material world this material existence in other words you know that's what secular is you know that, that people are seeing themselves more and more embedded in the material world that for them was taking a uh, center stage that the material world was becoming more important than the spiritual world. Now that the spiritual world, spiritual world didn't exist, uh, we're not suggesting here that people are abandoning, you know, the belief in God or the belief in the soul or the belief in the afterlife, etc. No, they do continue with those with those beliefs, but they're not playing a key role they're not playing a central role in people's lives anymore okay uh, those issues still matter to them god salvation the soul etc but uh they are spending most of their time and energy again to take care of their material bodies okay not their spiritual bodies in other words uh, so so what we see then is a decline of religious values, okay? So there's a sharp decline, there's a gradual and very sharp decline of religious values. People don't value going to church every day because uh, I need to attend some other activities, you know, like work. I need to go out of town because I need to do a business trip, etc. You know, maybe trade connections or trade arrangements or you know, maybe ship cargo to another town. We can be a merchant, for example. Okay. Uh, or you need to bring cargo from another town so you can sell it in your own town, etc. So you're now more engaged in, again, in material activities, in other words. So there's a decline of religious values. Uh, you don't value reading the Bible, you know, every day or reciting prayers every day. Okay. Uh, or you know, the praises and the hymns, for example, of church that you know they're scheduled every monday okay well you know people are going to miss that and you know they're not going to feel that 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 was again going to affect their salvation in other words so what we see is a sharp decline of religious values that is visible because you know people are not attending church every day anymore they're they are going to attend but they're going to attend only sundays for example, when they when they have to, which is Sunday, you know, the sermon, the service, and the like. Uh, so th there is a sharp decline again in church attendance. You know, not that they're empty. I'm not suggesting that churches are empty. It's just that people just go, you know, during Sundays, uh, and and that's pretty much it. The, the rest of the the week they spend it in in, in work, uh, attending other matters. So with that, of course, we're going to see the rise of materialist values as well. With the decline of religious values, 
we're going to see instead people becoming more and more oriented towards materialism, valuing more, you know, uh, the sensations or the rewards that this material world can bring. In other words, whether you have property or you're accumulating wealth or you have a new economic opportunity on the rise, etc. This is what people are valuing more. Those material experiences, material sensations, material rewards. Okay, so we see that taking place among the Puritans and even the Quakers. When they established their own colony uh, in the 1680s, they will go through the same process, by the way, as the Puritans uh, at any rate. Okay, so, so we, here we're just going to focus on the Puritans as a case study, particularly the Puritans of Massachusetts. And, and the question is why? Okay, so if we are going to pick a specific colony or a specific religious group uh, to look at change and how those societies were changing, why pick the Puritans? Well, because the Puritans were the most strict of all the other groups okay uh that came to north america and massachusetts was the colony that was, was the most strict of all the colonies in terms of uh people you know being so concerned about salvation that even the political leadership like the governors the judges the the, the ministers the uh, in in charge of uh, the, the councils the town councils and so on and so forth Again, uh, all over Massachusetts, they were all ministers, okay? There was a merge of church and state in Massachusetts in a way that the leading members of the church were at the same time the political leaders of the towns and the courts and the governorship, etc. Again, uh, and the reason why is because Massachusetts was a kind of, like a kind of an experiment, so to speak, in which uh, the Puritans that were... Uh, settling Massachusetts believed that this was going to be the perfect society that will create the conditions, the perfect conditions to guide people to heaven. It's going to be so disciplined, so rigorous, so demanding in the way people should behave, that people should dress, that people should be disciplined, that this is going to accelerate their spiritual progression. To the point that they're going to attain sainthood again and, and earn salvation after death. So this is the most conservative, the most disciplined, the most committed uh, colony, religious colony of all. So that's why I have chosen actually to look at uh, Massachusetts as a case study to look at how even this group, the Puritans of Massachusetts, uh, will be changing. Okay in the 1600s uh, and early decades of the 1700s uh, in a very significant way and how we're going to see the ministers, the elders responding to those changes, okay? How they cope with the changes taking place around them in terms of the Puritans of the second, third, fourth generation not being so committed to the original mission of Massachusetts, of Massachusetts colony, that people are going to be abandoning gradually, okay, this very firm belief that this was the mission of Massachusetts colony uh, to provide a, an ideal society for Puritans to help each other attain salvation, okay? So we're going to see here that uh, the Puritans, when we mean the Puritans are, again, the ministers, the leading ministers, the leaders of Massachusetts uh, and the elders, how they're going to cope with uh, those changes. And as we'll see, there will be two different ways that they're going to cope with the changes taking place. Okay, this decline in religious values and the rise of materialist values. And th those two ways are kind of universal when we look at conservative societies undergoing drastic, rapid change. Okay, 
when we see a very conservative society that's highly conservative and is trying to conserve a specific way of life uh, and is guided by conservative principles, conservative values, and so on, be those religious values or otherwise, what we see is that whenever those conservative societies experience change, they often cope uh, with those changes in two different ways. Okay, one is that one sector of Massachusetts colony, some ministers are going to go with the flow and they're going to adapt to the change and accommodate to the changes. This is called accommodation. So accommodation is when people pretty much uh, try to adapt to changing circumstances. Okay. Uh, and they try to be flexible. They provide room uh, to people that think different and they try to incorporate them into the society. Okay. Uh, so the society can continue. So they're flexible. There's a flexibility there. Okay. Uh, and on the other hand, there's going to be also a sector, a different sector of Massachusetts society that is not going to accept the change and will interpret the changes taking, the, taking place around them as a form of evil. Okay. <laughs> uh, because this is a religious setting. So, uh, remember, they see themselves as the chosen peoples of God. So, those that were not following the norms, those Puritans that were changing and not following the strict rules, the disciplines, etc., were thought of uh, people that were seduced by Satan. Okay? So, this is the work of the devil. And so, instead of accommodating them and being flexible to them, you know, uh, and accepting the changing times, the changing situations, they unleashed, of course, persecution upon those believed to be responsible for seducing people away from God, okay, labeling them, labeling those people as witches in many cases, and there'll be, of course, you know, a series of witch hunts. We're going to get to that, of course, uh, in just a few minutes. But, of course, this is, the, again, the, the two-sided coin, again, of looking at conservative settings, conservative societies uh, experiencing change and how uh, we see, of course, different responses to change. Some people accept the change, go with it. They go with the flow and they adapt, whereas others see change as a form of death, as a form of threat that needs to be met with violence in other words so you know there's often persecution against those people that don't conform that don't follow the rules if you will so this is also going to be an issue of course seen in massachusetts all right so Let's look first at, at uh, this flexible position <clears throat> of the Puritan ministers that were attempting to cope with change uh, taking place in Massachusetts, this decline, again, in religious uh, values. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at accommodation. Again, this is a flexible position. There are elders, there are ministers that see change as inevitable. This is part of life. Um, and although they accept change, they're not totally willing to let people go altogether, of course, and let, you know, uh, provide license to people so people can do whatever they want. But that's not the case. So we're not arguing here that this flexibility was going too far, you know, this flexible attitude again. No, it was just trying to compromise, you know, to pro make room for compromise. Uh, so the Puritans that were not totally committed to the religion, that were not attending church every day, that were not working towards their salvation, 
that instead of kicking them out of the colony, that's the way it, it was supposed to be. That those that did not conform to the teachings that were changing the the interpretations, the doctrine of the Puritans, uh, they were exiled. Remember, we looked at Roger Williams being exiled out of Massachusetts in 1636, and Anne Washington, likewise, in that decade, uh, she's also going to be exiled, and she went out to Connecticut. Roger Williams established Rhode Island, and, and it's a group of followers that came along with them. Um, so that was what's supposed to happen whenever people were not following strictly the norms. Uh, they were exiled, okay? And they were not full, full Puritans, but as to say, they were already, you know, changing. Uh, but the same issue is arising now in the late 1650s, early 1660s, as to, well, we now have a growing number of people in Massachusetts that are not what is called full Puritans, okay? Uh, what that means is that there's a lot of Puritans, particularly the young, the young generations, that uh, live in Massachusetts, but they're still unconverted, okay, church members. So what is unconverted is that they have not experienced their full conversion. They have not, in other words, uh, been reborn, okay? They have not attained the level of sainthood. They have not had a mystical experience, a direct experience with the divine, in other words. So they are converted. Uh, and they're not that disciplined, once again. They're not attending church every day and so on and so forth. And they, they see themselves as Puritans only because they're born out of Puritan parents, if you will, and they're born in the colony. But that's as far as they go in terms of practicing their religion, you know, because they're concerned with other things, other more material you know, needs and so on that is more, they're more important to them. So there's a growing number of unconverted church members, okay, uh, in Massachusetts, and so the question is: Should we, you know, you know, exile those groups uh, to other colonies? We send them away because uh, they're not really taking the religion that seriously. They're not committed. They're unconverted. Uh, when are they going to experience their spiritual rebirth? When are they going to be saved by the grace of God? In other words, when are they going to turn into saints? In other words, okay? Uh, so what about that? This is supposed to be the mission of the colony, but, you know, uh, there's a growing number of people that don't see this as important. This is secondary for them. Uh, so... Uh, what to do. So here is when we see the compromise, the accommodation, you know, uh, with compromise, meaning that, well, there was a group of ministers that decided that uh, that uh, some form of compromise was needed, okay? Because if they just started exiling people away from Massachusetts, kicking them out, etc., uh, that Massachusetts was not going to be settled or populated by any people in the future because the future was heading this way. You know, the, the new generations are going to born in Massachusetts and they're going to continue being kind of, you know, uh, unconverted. They're not going to be that disciplined uh, to, to, to church activities and disciplines. So, again, the compromise came with uh, the introduction of a piece of legislation created in Massachusetts that granted people uh, a halfway membership okay, uh, in the religion, in the religion of Massachusetts, in the Puritan religion, that this is, colony was supposed to be only for church members, people that were attending church, that were full members of the church, committed members, but because we have a growing group of people that are not really full members, they're just simply born out of Puritan families and so on, and they're not really attending church, 
full time, it's only half time. Well, we will allow you then to stay and live in Massachusetts as a halfway member of the Puritan Church. This was a piece of legislation titled the Halfway Covenant of 1662. The Halfway Covenant is that, well, uh, there's going to be a pact, an agreement, a covenant with people that are halfway members uh, to allow them, allow them to stay in Massachusetts. We're not going to exile them. We're going to create room for them, allow them to live here unconverted with the idea that they're going to attain salvation in a future time. That's the covenant. We allow you to stay with the idea that in the meantime, you're going to carry out some other activities that are important to you. But later on, in a future day, okay, you are going to return to the church, become full member, and attain salvation. So what the halfway covenant did is actually create two types of Puritans in Massachusetts, the full members that had attained their salvation, their spiritual rebirth. They have uh, experienced a mystical encounter with God, with the Holy Spirit, and so on. So they're now uh, fully converted, the full members. And there's also going to be the halfway members as well that will be awaiting their own spiritual rebirth. They're going to await their salvation. Uh, so, again, the, the, the people that frame the halfway covenant believe that the times were changing, that this situation, that people were not that interested in religion, was natural because the colonies were growing, there were more enterprises, there were certain material necessities that people wanted to meet, okay, and that people should be allowed to pursue those material needs, okay? Whether it's land or, you know, economic opportunities, etc. Uh, you know, uh, form a family and the like. So, so, again, the ministers believe that this was only natural, but their flexibility also rested on the notion that uh, because they were born inside of Massachusetts and they absorbed the Puritan religion from their parents, the, the Puritan faith was going to remain within, within themselves anyways throughout their lives, uh, so much so that in a future day, whenever they will mature, they grow older, they will realize the need to prepare their soul for the afterlife. And so they were going to come back, they said. Look, let them be. Let them, you know, pursue their, you know, uh, economic needs, etc., uh, their economic interests, uh, because uh, after all, they're going to actually save themselves. They, they're going to save their souls uh, after they grow older, after they mature. They're going to take on the disciplines that are going to, of course, uh, guide them to heaven. So, again, this is a very flexible position. Uh, it was a flexible position. In other words, people are that favor the halfway covenant are not, are not necessarily seeing this as a threat necessarily. You know, they're just trying to go with the flow and trying to accommodate. They're trying to create room, in other words, for those people that were changing to actually stay in the colony so they can remain in the colony and be influenced by the religion of their parents and their their elders so much so that in the future this was going to bear fruit that in the future they were simply going to come back to the church in other words okay anyways now not all uh, the ministers in Massachusetts were flexible. Not all the elders, not all the Puritan leaders had the same uh, flexibility to deal with 
change. There were those that saw or interpreted all of the changes taking place around them as uh, as a threat, as a menace coming from, in this case, from Satan. Okay, uh, and th the reason why is because. Uh, those ministers that I'm referring to uh, were people that that really believed that the Puritans were the chosen peoples of God, okay, the chosen ones. And this was a group of souls that God had selected to go to heaven. So for them, it was very important to guarantee the salvation of those people okay their spiritual salvation and any obstruction any impediments any obstacles were obstacles that were presented by the enemies of god you know, the enemies of god are the ones that are trying to lead god's chosen people astray from the spiritual path away from God away from the teachings of Christ away from the church away from all the disciplines that people needed to do to become you know to earn salvation uh, so so for them this was a black and white picture of the world there is in their minds again in in this picture in this black and white of course a good side and a bad side there's the forces of light there's the forces of darkness and there's nothing in between okay and the forces of light is God and everything that is God is good and we're part of God they said you know the Puritans uh, and on the other side of course the dark forces uh, the forces of Satan evil etc uh, and damnation and hell and everything okay uh, so, uh, in their minds, again, Satan was at war with God in order to snatch souls away from heaven, snatch souls uh, away from God, so to lead those souls, to confuse them, uh, to tempt them, and so on, so they can be interested in material things, in material desires, so they will simply abandon the belief in God and worship matter, okay, material things, and to glorify them and ultimately, you know, uh, go to hell after death because you're going to miss your own salvation because you were so trapped, again, in matter, in material desires and temptations that you forgot about the spirit, in other words. So this is how they see the universe again they see creation they see life in general in a very black and white uh, picture okay god and satan dark white and so on and so forth and so therefore those people that are changing those people that are not interested in church those people that don't go to church and so on they're simply being seduced by satan okay they're being tempted by satan to pursue other other pleasures and not take their salvation seriously which was the most important of course thing for a human being so in their minds the way this worked is that satan the way satan lured people away from god was by having people work for him so they're agents of satan in other words, there's people that work for the devil, again, uh, uh, and they're humans, and they, they live amongst ourselves, okay, and they're the ser servants of the devil, they're the servants of Satan, they do Satan's work, they do Satan's bidding, bidding uh, to tempt people away from God. Who are those? Well, the witches, okay, a witch, a sorcerer, and the like those are the servants of of darkness okay what they do is that they cast spells uh or hexes on people 
so they can be hypnotized so they can be seduced so they can be confused uh, and, and they can be totally guided away from the light in other words from God and so again there's going to be a sec a sector in Massachusetts of uh, Puritan ministers that are growing more and more and more convinced that there were witches living in you know amongst themselves okay and as we'll see uh, those witches the so-called witches are going to be blamed for the decline of religious values and those very conservative religious ministers are going to unleash a persecution uh, against people that they thought were witches because they blamed them for the changes taking place in Massachusetts. You know, this is the reason why our youth is not interested in God or they're not practicing okay, the disciplines and so on. Uh, it's because they're witches. There has to be some witches and they're casting spells. They're luring people away again from the church not to read the Bible and so on and so forth. So eventually this is going to lead to what's called a witch hunt, of course. And the most famous witch hunt in Massachusetts occurred in 1692 in a little town called Salem. And it was a very famous Salem witch trials, you know, that took place in 1692 that reveals that the colony was changing that the Puritan society was rapidly changing and there's going to be a reaction against the change and a very violent one by the way that ended up in a witch hunt you know people being accused of being witches and there's going to be a trial a series of trials people are going to be judged and some people will be found guilty and actually executed. Okay, so let us then look at, again, the Salem Witch Trials of Massachusetts as a case study to understand conservative societies undergoing significant change in how the most conservative elements of that society, the elders, the priests or ministers, etc., are going to see the change as a form of threat again as a menace as a form of death that need needed to be dealt with in the most furious in the most violent way in other words okay so again let us look then at the salem witch trials 1692 okay All right, so we're talking about Salem, Massachusetts here. Um, okay, got time here. All right, so let us just uh, scroll this down so we can see the map and the the name of the town, Salem. Okay, so Salem, Massachusetts. Okay, is north uh, to uh, north of Boston. It's also a port, as you can see in this map, is located here, okay? It's just like Boston, it's, it's also a port. And even though Salem started out as a quite simple farming community in its very early, early origins, when the Puritans established Salem, it was just, again, a very small farming community because it was located in, in uh, near the coast. Again, it's in the eastern, in the in the seaboard. Um, this is also going to uh, help uh, this small community called Salem grow into a very large town that is beginning to also receive merchandise from overseas, thereby becoming also an important international port. In Massachusetts not as important as Boston but Salem is going to be growing significantly 
in the 1600s to the point that it's also going to uh, again acquire you know a port is going to develop a port that is also going to be engaged in the import and export of products that were shipped not only to Europe but to different parts of the world it's an international port that is to say so okay so this is very important just to understand the geographical significance the location again of Salem so what we're going to see there is Salem uh, becoming divided over time I mentioned that it started out as a very simple farming community uh, very humble we were Puritans growing corn and wheat etc and sustaining their community simply by producing the food that they needed but as I mentioned over time uh, this port, this society is going to now also uh, participate in trade as well and because of international trade uh, this community is going to grow significantly but as it was growing it was becoming increasingly divided okay that by 1680 and the end of the 1680s in that decade just in that decade we're gonna see Salem sharply divided into two tight into two different parts okay two sections there were two parts of town in other words two different sections and those divisions were were very visible they were very sharp okay um, the part of town that faced the ports okay uh, this is the eastern side facing the port itself this is going to be the commercial part of town again in Salem uh, commercial because of its location you know facing the sea because of the international trade because there are merchants coming from Europe particularly they're coming from England some of them come from Holland there are Dutch merchants arriving here as well uh, we're going to see that this part of town is going to become extremely oriented towards commerce okay there's going to be a lot of commerce shops local industries there uh, trade shipping you know uh, industries arrive to deliver cargo to pick up cargo it's and so on and so forth this is the part of town that is the business section so to speak this is where the most of the most affluent families live affluent means the wealthy sector this is where the you know merchants again the people that are the owners of those local industries and local shops etc they live there and this is the part of town that was the most secular once again I repeat what is secular is uh, any society oriented towards materialism this is the most materialistic part of town that's what secular is you know uh, oriented towards pursuing material you know desires material needs material experiences that's what secular is materialist in other words uh, and the reason is because of the kind of economy this commercial economy uh, that developed in this part of town there are of course you know in different uh, types of industries on the rise like spinning industries people spin uh, cotton particularly uh, and they try to weave it into clothing okay? clothing that in many cases is exported uh, and, and it's sold in Europe for example uh, there's also beekeepers in the production of honey Con honey is being consumed both locally but it's also being exported as well to other colonies as well okay uh, out of Salem there will be merchants again exporting the honey and there's also uh, the the growing presence of beer makers people crafting beer and remember we're talking about a Puritan society that since the very beginning uh, banned alcohol alcohol consumption alcohol production alcohol was totally banned under Puritan law uh, in Massachusetts um, and what we see here is because of there's a growing presence of foreigners many of them are Dutch there's Dutch foreigners arriving 
and they bring with them, of course, their own beer uh, traditions. You know, they knowledge to craft beer, to produce it, and so on. And what we see is the local population picking up on those that knowledge, and they're beginning to also produce beer. And the beer is being produced particularly for the foreigners. Okay, so we're not talking about it here. People crafting beer and Puritans are you know drinking, etc. But rather, whenever there are merchants arriving to Salem, they stay for a day or two in the port uh, before they leave. You know, pick up merchandise, etc. Uh, they like to stay. There's there's gonna be lodging, for example, you know, there people are going to accommodate rooms inside of their homes to, you know, allow foreigners to stay a night or two, charge them like a lodging, in other words. But also there's going to be, of course, taverns or a pub, like a little pub, if you will, where people can actually drink a beer, etc. You know, as they wait for the cargo to be shipped, etc. Again, so there's beer makers as well. So what we see here is the rise of a liberal society. Uh, this part of town, what we see is that people are growing very liberal. Okay, uh, there's a commercial, you know, sector here, businesses, families that are, you know, growing in wealth, and very materialist oriented. Uh, and of course, there's now the production of beer, there's the presence of foreigners and so on and so forth. But also and more alarming is that this liberal society was also one in which we see the growing presence of independent women. OK, uh, when we say independent is that those women were not uh, dependent on men. OK, they were self-reliant. They were not married. They were single in many cases. Uh, in many cases, their property was passed on to them uh, by a family member. Okay, left a piece of land, for example, uh, to them. And they were in charge of that property. They were property owners, for example. Okay, uh, so even though women were not allowed to own property, you know, in colonial America. Nonetheless, there were exceptions in different sectors of the colonies in which women were in charge of properties. They were in charge of pieces of land that were passed on by family members, for example, a father, etc., uh, or a brother that died and left the property to the women, etc. Uh, again, so they were independent. They were self-reliant. And in many cases, they operated certain certain businesses for example like for example they were you know providing accommodation lodging for merchants uh, Dutch merchants for example arriving there uh, so this was not seen very well uh, by the uh, cons Puritan conservatives because you know what would you expect you know that you know when, whenever you saw a woman you know welcoming a foreigner a total stranger in her home and providing lodging for example uh, accommodation renting a room etc so what we see of course is that the most conservative members of Salem were not seeing this with good eyes you know something wrong with this because they saw that this was just too liberal there was again people were not attending church uh, regularly, you know, there was a very relaxed church attendance during this part of town. Uh, we're not going to see people uh, attending church the way other, you know, people were in Massachusetts in other towns. Uh, and also, there's also the alarming or the scandal uh, of, uh, of uh, women, particularly in this part of town, uh, the independent women that were single in many cases having very liberal relationships again with foreigners that were arriving you know, sexual license for example okay uh, that very often this will happen and you know so this is a very conservative environment highly conservative and what is taking place here is that uh, some women were stepping out of bounds they were abandoning the norms. They were not dressing according to the standards of a Puritan women, for example. Okay, they were not behaving accordingly. Uh, 
they were not dependent on man, okay? They were self-reliant. Again, this is kind of the uh, the the kind of typical women of today's world in, in our modern world, for example, women are independent, they're self-reliant and so on. So this is the beginning stages of that. This is when this is beginning to arise. Again, this uh, new liberal society, in which women were now very gradually, slowly but surely becoming more and more independent. Uh, and they were, you know, choosing what they wanted to dress. They were choosing what they want to believe, etc. And that's exactly, again, what was so alarming and scandalous that those women were becoming too liberal and they were adopting the values of the Dutch. The Dutch were seen as being too liberal by the Puritans. You know, they drank a lot of beer, you know, uh, their socialization, you know, uh, men and women also was very, very loose, very liberal and so on and so forth. But what was more alarming was that many people in this part of town, including women, many of the independent women, were not just not attending church on a regular basis, but in many cases they were questioning the traditional religious beliefs of the Puritans. They were questioning, you know, for example, why women needed to dress uh, uh, very conservative, okay, from from head to toe, for example, all covered. Uh, why? Why, for example, okay, why women needed to get married, okay? Uh, why uh, women were not allowed, you know, to be the leaders of the church, and so on and so forth. Uh, what, what today we simply call feminism, in other words, there were uh, women that were arguing that the religion was very male-dominated, in other words, okay? So, of course, we see a lot of women questioning the traditional religious beliefs of the Puritans, and this is also going to, to be very, 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 uh, you know, important for understanding the backlash against particularly the liberals, you know, uh, of Salem. Of course, and as we'll see, they're going to be labeled witches, as we'll see. Of course, the other part of town, the part of town that was in the west section, away from the port, uh, in the interior of the town, that is, this is the traditional sector. This is the traditional uh, uh, sector or region of Salem, okay, where people still... Uh, live a very conservative lifestyle. Many of them are farmers, uh, just growing corn, growing wheat in order to sustain their families. They're pretty much continuing the traditions of their forefathers, again, by simply conducting their daily activities, dressing in the traditional attires, going to church quite regularly, uh, obeying their ministers, you know, as if they were the representatives, for example, of God, you know, they were attending the church on a daily basis and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, this part of town uh, was quite humble economically because we're not going to see the rise of commerce or industries or shops or businesses, you know, so this is not the part of town that was engaged in trade, but rather this is a part of town in which we see simply farmers growing their own food. So this looked like the poor section, even though they were not necessarily poor, they had land, they had food and so on. Uh, but they compared, compared to the other side, this, this part of town looked quite poor, quite humble. Okay, so it's very traditional. This is a very traditional environment in every possible way, okay? People preserve the customs, the traditions, and so on and so forth. And this is the part of town that is going to grow very much alarmed at the other part of town in the east section, the commercial section. And of course, whenever a society, whenever a community becomes so sharply divided in this fashion, that there's a discrepancy in the way people live, the, their values, etc., uh, they're so different from one another, they're total polar opposites. What is going to happen is that we're going to see then that those two sections are going to develop a lot of tensions. And eventually there will be conflict because they're so different. 
they are part of the same town. They're both part of Salem, but they're incredibly different to the point that those differences are going to uh, divide them. They're going to divide them to the point that this is going to create, of course, tension and eventually conflict that is going to lead to the witch hunts. Particularly, again, witch hunts are persecutions, accusations that were initiated by the traditional section. The people that are in the traditional side, of course, are going to see that those that live in the commercial side, the affluent, the materialistic uh, settlers of East Salem, uh, were agents of Satan, in other words, that their wealth is not really coming from God, that their affluence, their economic success was not uh, a gift from God, but rather that they made a pact with the devil to be wealthy, that they pacted with Satan to be wealthy because how is it possible that they're so successful economically, but yet don't go to church? Why is it that they're so affluent, they're so wealthy, when they even question the Bible, they question the ministers, and their churches are empty? So uh, from their understanding is, you know, their wealth doesn't come from God. It actually comes from Satan. <laughs> uh, and there must be a lot of witches over there, by the way, that are serving Satan. They're the ones that are casting spells and eventually, of course, luring people away from the church. So maybe they're the ones that are causing all of the problems in the colony. They're the ones that are actually seducing our population away from God, in other words. So again, this is going to eventually, again, all of, this, uh, all of those concerns... Uh, as to why the other side is so wealthy, why the other side is so prosperous, and so on. Eventually, this is going to lead to a lot of economic anxiety uh, in Salem, in the poor side of town, that some members of this traditional part of town of Salem are going to grow hysterical. There's going to be paranoia again. Uh, there's like a sort of... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's called hysteria, but there's like a nervous breakdown, if you will, perhaps the economic anxiety, the desperation, or because there was simply so much change taking place around them, okay? There was just people abandoning uh, the Puritan way of life that they believed that as more and more people were abandoning Puritanism, that the religion was simply to, going to die off. It was simply going to die and the society was going to disintegrate as a whole. That was what they thought, is that, uh, that the future of Massachusetts uh, looked not very bright because they said, if people are simply going to abandon God and abandon the religion, uh, our society is going to decay. Uh, there will be you know, loose morals, there will be degeneration, there will be sin, etc. And, you know, our society will degrade to the point that it will simply disintegrate altogether. And we're all going to be damned. We're all going to go to hell, you know, as a, as a consequence. Again, so it is precisely those fears, those anxieties, you know, caused by change, by rapid change, that is going to cause hysteria, again, in Salem. A hysteria is like a nervous breakdown, if you will. Is when the mind can't take it anymore. People become so stressed that they start hallucinating and they start seeing things around them that might not be real and they grow very paranoid. And many of those paranoid uh, delusions that people entertain, again, were simply the ideas that the people living in the other side of town in the affluent, again, part of Salem were witches, that they were surrounded by witches and that they were casting spells, they were sending evil spirits to torment the peoples of God again. So people felt that they were surrounded by evil spirits, that they were tormented, etc. So again, what leads to this hysteria? What is the background of this hysteria in Salem? Well, first and foremost, please understand that, uh, you know, 
here what we see is that people do have belief in the supernatural you know the puritans believe in magic okay so this uh the series of beliefs again in magic in spirits in demons and ghosts was part of the puritan worldview okay uh puritans do follow their faith they follow their religion uh, but what's important is that Puritans also believe in the dark side. They, they believe that it exists, that it's populated by spirits and, and demons, etc., and that there are ghosts, and that people can actually cast spells, and there's magic, and so on and so forth. Again, so this is part of the Puritan worldview, if you will. But also, what is also significant is that what we see among the Puritans is... Uh, that there are, of course, some youngsters in Salem, particularly in Salem, that are beginning to practice okay, magic rituals. You know, the, there's a growing popularity. There's a growing tendency in Salem for people to practice magic. And one of the reasons is um, that there's also some African slaves introduced in Salem during this time. Uh, they are introduced to work as servants inside of the homes of some ministers. And in the traditional side, what we see is that some ministers had also slaves, of course, working as servants. And they brought with them uh, some of their African religious traditions. Uh, again, uh, that involved, you know, conjuring spirits, the spirits of the land, the spirits of rain, the spirits of the rivers, the spirits of the forest, and working with spirits, in other words. So, uh, the young girls, particularly in Salem, again, in the traditional side, are going to take on those practices and become very attracted. They will try to learn, of course, uh, some of those African traditions and they're going into the woods and conjuring also spirits and trying to also cast spells and so on and so forth again so there was a growing interest also again in in rituals that involve working with spirits and some of the girls particularly those that are closely related to the reverend samuel paris who was leading the main church in the in the traditional side of Salem, uh, the niece and the daughter are amongst one of the girls, this group of girls that are going into the forest and conjuring spirits and so on and so forth and trying to learn. It's a curious, curiosity, if you will, but the fact is that they were involved, again, in magic-related beliefs and practices. Uh, so... Over time, what we're going to see is that those girls uh, are going to report being tormented by spirits. Why? Well, we don't know. But they simply report that they see spirits everywhere. That they see demons, that they see ghosts, and that they're being tormented. They hear voices as well. Okay? So, uh, this is be becoming a growing concern. In Salem... Because the Reverend Samuel Paris uh, wants to find out why this is happening. Why is it that a group of girls, some of whom involve his own daughter and niece, are being tormented by spirits? They see them in the air. They see them in the community. They see them all around them. Uh, are those real visions or are those hallucinations? You know, that's the, the, the issue. Uh, so, again, even historians are trying to determine what exactly was this. Was this a hallucination? It was reported that during this time, there was the corn, there was a plague affecting the cornfields of the farmers of Salem. And it was a fungus, okay, that was growing with the corn that people were eating anyways, but this fungus was hallucinogenic, okay? So, some historians uh, are convinced that perhaps because of the contamination of the corn with this fungus, that perhaps this was the source of this mass hysteria, this mass paranoia of people 
in which people were now experiencing, you know, visions or hallucinations, hearing voices of spirits and the like. Again, this was mass hysteria in, in Massachusetts. So, again, what is happening is that, again, there's a growing hysteria that starts with the girls and is beginning to spread all over town. And more and more people are convinced that those spirits are real, that were there, and they were tormenting people, of course. Now, what happened is that as time progressed, uh, they report, this group of girls, that they also saw witches in Salem. That those spirits tormenting them were coming from certain houses. They will say, oh, this person I see is a witch and she's bewitching me. She's responsible for sending spirits to me. They were, they were pointing out that the homes of certain individuals or naming people that uh, they were convinced they were the witches. Most of these people happened to live, of course, in the other side of town that I just mentioned that was very liberal, in the liberal side of Salem. That is, the way, that is to say, so once again, what we see is the conservative, traditional Puritans growing hysterical, experiencing hallucinations, etc., uh, telling the members of their community that there were ghosts or spirits or demons in the community coming out from certain homes from those the liberals of course and the the liberal side if you will and uh, they were casting spells this is obvious they said so all of those spirits were sent to us by those witches the witches are uh, summoning those spirits and unleashing those spirits onto us to torment us of course uh, because we're the peoples of God and so on and so forth. So again, what this led to is the idea that, oh, this is why Massachusetts is, is changing. This is why we, we see a decline in religion because there's witches. There's witches, you know, performing magic and they're sending spirits to people to seduce them away from God, in other words. So this led to a series of accusations uh, 40 individuals were accused of witchcraft, mostly women, liberal women, independent women. Some of them actually own property. And we're going to see that those 40 individuals were tried under a Puritan court. And uh, they were, mostly were found guilty. Uh, 22 were actually executed and their property was confiscated, by the way. So... Uh, this is a very clear example how certain societies cope with change and that not all change is welcomed by the members of a conservative society. What we see is that some members, the most conservative elements, the most conservative individuals of a society are not willing to change and they see change as a form of death. And what actually happens is that they see in those individuals that don't conform to the rules, those that change, those that don't dress the way they're supposed to dress, those that don't follow the norms, they behave different. Those that are different. In other words, they target them as the ones causing the problems in the society. They're agents of Satan, they're witches and so on. And you know, we need to pretty much get rid of them because by doing so, we're gonna save the society. If we can only get rid of those people that don't conform, uh, then we can go back to how we were traditional. In other words, you know, to stay on a traditional you know, track, okay, to be traditional, to dress the way we're supposed to dress, behave the way we're supposed to behave, and be religious, okay, uh, according to the doctrine. So again, this is a very clear example of how there, we're going to be looking at clashes between tradition and modernity, okay. The uh, commercial part of Salem was modernizing, it was becoming too liberal, and it was clashing with the east side, the conservative. Uh, and so we see the clashes there again, the tradition and modernity clashing, and in this case there will be a violent reaction against, again, the liberal side of Salem, of course, you know, there were witch hunts in this case, okay? So that uh, is all I have for you as for now. I went over about 10 minutes, but anyways, um, uh, this is all I have for you. I'll see you then in session two so we can continue this subject again on religion. This is the end of session one. We'll continue then on Wednesday. Thank you.